kad Latvijā sauca Irbe kā mūris, Čehiem bija savs varonis – dominātors. Tagad asi aizstāv Ukraina. Vai NHL vadībai jāatkāpjas? Kāpēc Čehija nav gatava bojkotēt olimpiskās spēles? Un ko viņš teiktu, ja satiktu Putina atbalstītāju zvaigzni Ovečkinu? Čehijas hokeja leģenda Dominiks Hašeks – viens pret vienu Prāgā. Mr. Hašek, it's, I'm happy to meet you here in Prague. Uh, pleasure to meet you in, on Latvian TV. Uh, my first question is that since the beginning of the war, you've been very vocal and active, tweeting, writing open letters to organizations of, of sports to ask for exclusion of Russian sportsmen for, uh, from tournaments. Why is so important to you? Yes, you're right. I am very active since the day one, or let's say from the beginning of war, because I feel that way. I, 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 I just hate what is going on in Ukraine. I mean, you know, the Russian aggression, the people dying, and this is the terrible thing. So I decide to be vocal and to be active because I believe it, it can help. It can help the people and it can help uh, Ukrainians because they are under attack. And you're right, I was writing the letter to Gary Batman maybe two, three weeks after, after war started. And I trying to explain to him why it's important that Russian players under these circumstances need to be suspended. And I say suspended, but I also say let's help, not Russia, but let's help. Russian players or Russian athletes, so it has to be connected. Anyway, under today's circumstances, I try to explain Mr. Batman why Russian have to be suspended and not play, not be on the ice in the NHL. Uh, any reaction, officially or unofficially, from top officials of NHL so far? It's a one year since the war started. And when I wrote, I emailed this official letter to nice letter to Gary Batman. He he answered me very simply, like Dominic, thank you for the letter, but I have different opinion, sort of like this. And after that, we did not have connection, you know, until until October, when NHL played two games in Prague, and Mr. Batman, he got a letter from our Minister of Foreign Affairs that Russian players are not welcome in the Czech Republic and we don't want them on the ice because it's sort of support of the war. And, and he, he, didn't, he, he got a letter, I know mm -hmm. it, but Russian players and the, everybody got visa from Germany because Germany, is, they play exhibition game before in Germany and one team in Switzerland, one team in Germany, they got visa over there. And once you get a visa in European Union anywhere, you are allowed to be to go to the Czech Republic, to other, any other country. And uh, and but he knew that mm. the Russian players are not welcome here. He knew exactly what's going on. We, I I was trying to tell him, and he didn't care. You know, he yeah. said the Russian players will play in the Czech. So I start to understand he doesn't care. He doesn't care what our country says. He feels like I'm in power, I am the man. I don't care about Czechs. I don't care about Ukraine. And it really upset me. It really, I was so upset. And I said publicly, since that day, I'll do anything what is in my power to get him out. I mean, out from the leadership uh, of the NHL. Mm -hmm. And I said, until Gary Batman will be the head of the NHL uh, and and not and somebody else, whoever it's going to be, yeah. they need to apologize to our country. Until that, NHL will never ever be back in the Czech Republic. Anyway, it's continued since then. I, I wrote the official letter, as you probably know, I wrote the official letter to the NHL. It was public letter, anybody can read it. Just try to explain why it's so important that Russian players under today's circumstances, I always have to say under today's circumstances, cannot play on the NHL. And the reason is simple. It's a huge advertisement for the war. 
because Russian players are Russian citizens and any time they go on the ice, they sort of legalize the war. So it's about please, I say please, NHL or it, any, any, any competition, any league, don't help Putin legalize the war and help him to kill the people. So under these circumstances, the Russian players cannot go on the ice because they, ad they advertise the terrible war and all the crimes, all the crimes, including genocide of the children. That's a terrible thing. So you think the top officials of NHL should resign? Yes, <laughs> no, it, it, it's, no uh, <laughs> it's a decision of the owners, you know, yeah. there are 30 or 31 owners and they select whoever is there. But uh, Mr. Gary Batman, he's the leader. And what he's done to the Czech Republic, you know, when he refuses, uh, when he, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they gave him, they said that Russian players are not welcome in the Czech Republic and he, said no they are coming you know because they got visa not from the czech they got visa from germany but yeah, they were I allowed see. to go here so it was it was difficult but he he didn't care he didn't care mm -hmm. and so i say yes i'll do anything what is in my power to to get him uh, from the head of the nhl i think it's it's important and i tell you one thing it's not against the nhl i am i am i was a big part of the nhl and i I, I actually, NHL is in my heart. I, get, I play 16 season. I still feel like I want to do the best for the NHL. But if the person like him is is the head commissioner mm -hmm. of the NHL, I don't think it's the right thing. So my goal, of course, it's uh, I don't want him to be in the in the the head of the NHL yeah. anymore because I think it's a wrong thing. Talking about uh, athletes, uh, you know Alex Ovechkin, you met him on the ice. And if you were meeting him today, what should you say to him? <laughs> uh, what should I say to Alex? Yeah. I don't know. I, I have nothing to say to him, first of all. Uh, he has his faith and whatever he feels, that's, that's his decision. Let's say, I mean, I say, he was a big Putin supporter in 2018. Uh, and because uh, before president election in, in, in Russia. And it was four years after uh, Russia took Krim, Krim Peninsula. So we know that he is Putin supporter. We know that Putin his imperialistic uh, thinking and he supports him. We know that, you know, he has his picture. He said it many times publicly or privately. So, but it's, this is his decision. This is his opinion and this is his faith. And I don't agree with him. I don't completely disagree with him. I don't like the way he thinks or he feels, you know, I think he's doing wrong thing. But this is, his, this, this is his decision. However, I'll go back what I said in the beginning. NHL gives him the chance to go on the ice. He is, Alex Ovechkin is part of the NHL. NHL promotes him, marketize him. And what NHL, NHL let him go to the All-Star game. NHL let him play every game. NHL celebrates him. So NHL is responsible for that. NHL gives him the chance to promote the Russian war. It means NHL promotes the war and NHL is responsible for, for damages in Ukraine. NHL is responsible for lost lives of Ukrainian people. Not only Ukraine, of course, there are Russian people dying also. So I, I do completely disagree with Alex Ovechkin. However, I will always blame the NHL that let him advertise the Russian war. This is not about uh, just the uh, NHL. This is about other big organizations, for instance, uh, WTA uh, on ATP, tennis organizations as well. It, it's, a, it's about my message, and I wrote a letter especially, or I am more involved with the NHL because I was a big part of, of hockey the, my whole life, and I spent 16 or 18 years in the NHL. So. And I do it because I want to do the best for the NHL. Yeah. You know? However, 
you're right. And I don't care any organization, any leak in the world that under two, I have to repeat it, under today's circumstances, let's Russian player play mm-hmm. and go with us on the ice or on the track and field or swimming in the yeah. competition. Every league, every organization, not only the NHL, means supports the war. That's why I wrote the letter also to WTA and ATP, right. which are big tennis organization. And there are many smaller organizations, but the biggest are, at least what I feel, are tennis is huge around the world. So anytime any Russian player or uh, whatever is a girl or boy goes and play the ga- great game of tennis, they advertise the Russian war. So I was writing this letter not only to the NHL, but also WTA uh, and ATP. And actually I wrote a sentence on the end that it's that every league every org- uh, sports organization should read it and it applies to them also. Yes, I would like to quote one one of the tennis legends, actually, um, Billy Jean King, who said that Russian and Belarusian athletes should be allowed to play. And I'm quoting, life is too short, just have them play and get their money. Just that thing. Uh, Mrs. Billy Jean, Jean King, you are completely wrong. I admire you. I remember when I was a little boy, he was winning the, the Wimbledon tournament. But, but, uh, but she's wrong. Uh, they are human lives. For me, it's much more than the money. Uh, I wish, uh, I wish, actually, I wish Belarusian and Russian players make this money. Actually, in my first letter, by the way, to Gary Batman, I say, pay them the money, please pay them the salary to the Russian players, but don't please, don't let them go on the ice because they advertise the war. Pay them the millions, but don't let them go please because it costs lives in Ukraine. So I just want to explain to people and to Billy Jean's King, any citizen of the Belarusian, any citizens of Russia who steps on the court, it's a huge advertisement for the war, it's a huge, I'm not talking about million, mm-hmm. maybe one player is million dollar advertisement, but through the whole year, through the all Wimbledon, Paris, uh, whatever, um, New York, <laughs> all these Grand Slam tournaments, we're talking about billions of dollars advertisement of the war. And it's hard to, it's hard to count if, if, if there is the bomb falling on the, on the house, you know, there are, you can go and count. There are 20 dead people. Uh, 10 people injured uh, lightly, 10, pe- um, 10 people without legs or something, and damage for 10 million dollars, let's say. It's easy to count. It's difficult to count this advertisement. But I tell you, tennis organization WTA and ATP is responsible for losing lives in Ukraine. Thousands, mm. probably, what are they doing? And the damages of, uh, and, and other damages. Believe or not, it's difficult to count it, but they are responsible. And I want WTA and ATP pay Ukraine these billions of dollars. And it's nothing wrong, you know. <laughs> Actually, believe me, it's not any it's not any punishment for you. For you, I mean for tennis players or for, for tennis organization. It's what you need to do because you've done huge advertisement for Putin war. So now you have to pay billion of dollars back to Ukraine. It's it's just the right thing to do. And please stop right away. Let Russian players, tennis players, girls or boys play tennis with you. Under today's circumstances, maybe we go back under what circumstances they deserve to play and make these millions of dollars. Or Mrs. Billie Jean King, pay them the money. Please give them millions of dollars. They can win in Wimbledon. But please don't let them step on the court. Recently, uh, another organization, uh, International Olympic Committee, uh, said that um, they want to allow to participate in next year's Summer Olympic Games um, athletes from Russia and Belarus. And this is uh, this has caused a huge stir around the world to allow or not to allow. How do you evaluate evaluate their position? We're talking about something which is in 2024 but today starting the qualification and we cannot let Russian and Belarusian players be part of qualification. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I mean, let me say, I wish them go back. I wish Russian athletes and Belarusian athletes can compete with us. 
and we need to help them to get them back with us. However, not an NHL, not tennis organization, not the, not the Olympics International Committee. Nobody is helping Russian players, Russian athletes to get back and compete with us. We need to help Russian athletes. We cannot help Russia. Now we're helping Russia to mm -hmm. let them play. But we have to help Russian athletes to get back and compete with us. But nobody. I was talking to the head of the Czech uh, Olympic Committee and I asked him, are we helping the Russian athletes? Are you in touch with them? Do we email them every day? Uh, do you, are you in touch? You know, are you telling them what they can do and how they can back and compete with us? You know, I, I cannot believe. Like, and I said, no, we are not in touch with anybody. I said, how come you are not in touch with them? I, I am the athletes. I mean, not anymore. <laughs> but I cannot imagine how these Russian athletes feel. They cannot compete on the international level. They mm. maybe they are great athletes, and now they cannot do it. And the Olympic Committee, the Olympic, doesn't help them, doesn't tell them what to do, how to help them. This is a terrible thing. So listen to me. I am talking about how to suspend Russian athletes. And maybe some people listen and feel like, oh, he doesn't like Russia. No, I like Russian athletes. And first of all, we have to help them. But nobody does a shit, I have to sell it, to help them. So first of all, let's start to help Russian athletes. So mm -hmm. they can go back and compete with us. I wish, for, and it would be great for us. It yeah. would be great for the world. But nobody is helping them. Only everybody is talking and, and but doing nothing. And this is a terrible thing. More than 30 countries, including my country, Latvia, is considering to boycott these games yes. if Russian and, 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 and Belarusian athletes will be allowed to participate. What about the position of Czech committee? Uh, uh, Czech you, committee, you I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of... I, they don't want let's, to boycott. Let's uh, uh, boycott. Boycott is the last thing. Okay. And I sort of... I don't disagree with you, uh, no problem, but boycott is the is the last thing, you know. I'm surprised why even we get to, to this. You know, why to boycott it? Let's don't talk about boycott. Talk about not even chance that Russian art and Belarusian athletes can go get for qualification. So I sort of agree with the Czech committee that they say no, no, no boycott, like boycott, you know, it's too far. It's, it's, it's maybe before Olympics. We can... We cannot even get any chance Russian players be back in the qualification. Unfortunately, Mr. Bach or some people have a little bit different opinion. They said certain things and now we are like, maybe yes, maybe no. No, we have to put... That, there should be... That's very disappointing. That's very disappointing how it even get to this position. To this position. Yes. So, so I'm so I am not mm. for the boycott. I, you know what, I don't even want to talk about it to get so I far. See. And one day if we get mm. a little bit farther, the bad way, the wrong way, we can talk about it. But for, by myself, I'm not for the boycott, but I can, I wish, and I told that the head of the Czech in, um, Olympic Committee, you have to be more strict. You have to give them the Russian, whatever you say, it has to be very clear that under today's circumstances, there is no chance that, that, that your athletes can compete. On the other hand, I said, but you have to help, not Russia, but Russian athletes to get back and compete with us under circumstances which not helping the Russian state and Russian war. I hope mm -hmm. you understand yeah, what I say. Yes, I am, absolutely. How to help Russian uh, athletes? Um, maybe to allow to, to participate uh, for, for those who are um, openly condemn this uh, aggression, uh, condemn the war, uh, maybe let uh, them to, to participate in Olympic Games, other tournaments, in some y form. Yes, uh, what is important, I know it's not easy. I think the uh, head of International uh, Olympic Committee or head of the league, you have to work to the, together with the governments of the state. Uh, and there are Russian athletes, some, some of them, or maybe many of them, we don't know. The problem is I don't even know there is thousand athletes and we don't know if 1% oppose the war or 99% oppose the war. We have no idea, nobody knows anything. 
because nobody is talking to them. That's the biggest problem. So we need to help all of them and give them a chance. Okay, if you oppose Putin's war and genocide of the children and all the crimes, our state, let's say Czech Republic or USA or Latvia or Germany, we, you allow to go to our country, we give you refugees, we, we give you or we, yes, we will mm -hmm. present you, we will give you the refugees visa, but not only for the athlete. We should help this family. It means he could bring his wife or his children because we don't know what could happen to them in Russia. We need to help them like USA help my teammates or the, the Czech national players like Václav Nedomanský, Frankie Musil, Peter Klima. There are many players who, re, who defected from the Czech Republic, but they got help from the United States. Now, now nobody gets to these players the, uh, the refugees visa. Anyway, so if the player, the athletes wants to oppose Putin's war, and he wants to live that way publicly and privately, if he really wants to do it, he deserves to get a uh, refugee visa and these athletes. And I don't know if it's going to be one athlete. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's nobody. Maybe it's going to be 100 athletes. I don't know how many of them. So he deserves to get a refugee visa and athletes like that. They deserve to play in our leagues. They deserve to go to the Olympics, but not under a Russian national team. They should be a refugee team. They should be part of a refugee team. And it's, it happened before. I know there are some African refugee team, so now they could be a refugee team from, from Russia, from Russian athletes. And this is how these athletes should be helped. And these athletes, whatever is the girl, tennis player, whatever is the boy on the ice or, or the swimmer, mm -hmm. they could be the best ambassadors against the Russian war. It would be fun. Can you imagine what it would be like if in the Olympics there is like 30 Russian former or Russian citizen or former Russian citizen. This is just a play with the, with the, with the wars. Yeah. But they are part of the refugee war who really refuses the Russian war. So give these guys, the boys and girls, these athletes the chance to compete with the best players in the world. But don't let them compete as a Russian citizens and, and uh, uh, as a, as a, for Russia. Mm. Our Latvian goalie, your former colleague, Artur Sirbe, legendary goalie for Latvians, uh, said in an interview that it is not so much a question of sports organization that for athletes themselves to speak out and say athletes' position, that they refuse to play uh, in tournaments where, where um, Russians or Belarusians are playing. First of all, say me, uh, let me say hello to Artur Sirbe. Hi, Artur. <laughs> what a great goalie. Uh, he beat me a few times, but I beat him also. <laughs> For sure. Uh, anyway, he's right. I wish, I wish to see more athletes to speak up. I wish. But, you know, we are, everybody is different. And I'm not the one who will, I will help. I will help Russian athletes. I will help any athlete around the world to speak up. But I don't. I will never force him. Like you have to do it. You have. To, I mean, this is his decision on the end of the day. But if somebody wants to talk, let's help them. Help these people to speak up. Sometimes it's not easy. I know it's not easy. And I know if I am the player in the NHL, don't think I would speak. I, I don't think I would be so strong and speak up. You know, you are part of the organization, which feels a little bit different way right, than you do. So it's a little bit complicated. So it's a little bit different on the international issue and then a little bit if it is your job. You know, it's, it's with your job and you can lose the job and you can be down. And, and so it's, it's, there are two different issues. It could be more complicated. Anyway, I wish to see more athletes who speak up. However, I have to say it's more difficult when you are active athlete. Right. It is more difficult and that's why I don't blame athletes. They don't speak up. I blame more. I would... I would play more like athlete like me, let's say, the former athletes, because I have nothing, to, I mean, I have, uh, I cannot lose my job, you know, my job like uh, like athlete, and uh, I don't play the game anymore, so I can see it from different position. So I think there should be, I wish to speak up any, speak out any athlete. However, 
especially retired athletes, they, they should much more speak out. Anybody who feels like to speak up, we, we need to support them. Even, I tell you, I need, a, I need a support. Anytime I see my friends come to me and damn, you know, I like what you say. It helps me, it helps me and I'm like, yes, I know I'm doing the right thing. But if I see support from, from friends and from the family and from, from other people who coming, like I walk on the street and people come to me and say, damn, you know, what do you say, you're right, you know, be, be, be vocal, speak out. That's a great support and then I feel like, yes, I do the right thing. I am helping the people. I know I am helping the people. I know I am helping save many lives. However, if I feel support, it's, it's, it helps me. And any athletes who wants to speak out or he feels that can save their lives, we need to help them. Not only the Russian, but everybody. But Russian, they need, at this time, especially Russian players, Russian athletes, they need the help. Coming back to, to what Artur Silva said in, in that interview in Latvian television, he also said, in his opinion, money and also corruption play too big of a role in um, modern sports. He said this is very sophisticated, politically correct corruption around the world right now in all organizations. I know there are mm, a lot of Russian money in hockey. I know there are a lot of Russian money in, in the Olympic sport. but. I don't know if and how of officials are corrupt. So I, I don't have exactly answer, but it's terrible to see Mr. Bach, who is the head of the IOC, to see be with Putin on the pictures, even after 2014, after they, after, uh, after they, um, the Russian took the, uh, the Crimean Peninsula. So there are certain things I really don't like, but I don't know how much, how big is the corruption. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, NHL has a year is six, six billion of income, uh, and IOC is about two billion a year. It's a lot of money, and lots of this money coming from Russia. We know lots of this money coming from Russia. But, uh, and I was reading something about FIFA, you know, about the World Championship, we know about Olympics in Peking in last, uh, in China in last uh, six or ten years. Uh, same thing in Sochi. And it's, uh, it didn't help the war, uh, the, the world, you know, mm. it didn't help. It helped uh, Putin and it helped Chinese Communist regime. Former International Ice Hockey Federation President René Fazel uh, has obtained Russian citizenship and uh, took the majority state in one of uh, Russian companies, which is the biggest producer of, of uh, apples. Apples, 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 apples oranges. Yes, did that news surprise you? Uh, first of all, it's a terrible news, you know. Even Mr. Fazel is not the head anymore of the of the. He's IO a former, yeah, right. Uh, I think he still has a lot of connections to Olympic sports and to the, to the hockey. Uh, and under today's circumstances, when the Russian uh, is in war, I mean, makes imperialistic and attacking war on Ukraine, they are, lying, they are dying every day, like hundreds of people on the each side, on Ukraine and Russian side. And I, I don't, first of all, I don't understand what's the reason for that. However, it, it looks terrible for, uh, it's a, I think it's a terrible, not I think, I know it's a terrible decision because it looks terrible on hockey and on the Olympic sport if Mr. Fazel took uh, Russian citizens, citizenship under these circumstances or even some stake in the Russian company. I, it, it surprised me, yes, it's, I, I heard certain things about him, how close he is to, to Russian officials, but this is, this is terrible. This is terrible. It looks terrible on hockey, even he is not anymore the head of the International Hockey Federation. The third period about Nagano and about this movie. Okay, so now yeah, we so talk we about can hockey. just yeah, okay. more relaxed more on that. Relaxed, yeah. But yesterday, yesterday, Mr. Hashik, you took part in the premiere of the movie Children of Nagano. Deti of Nagano. Deti yeah. uh, <laughs> Nagano. You are a patron of that movie. Yeah? I was part. Uh, the director of the movie came to me about. 30 months ago, two and a half years ago, and, and he told me what, that he wants to make a movie. And I said, okay, about Nagano, okay, whatever. And then he told me the whole idea, and I said, you know what? 
Dan is his name, Dan, Dan Panek. And I say, I like it because it's not really about us, it's about the children and we are their heroes, we are their inspiration. And because it's about the children, I really want to be involved in it. So I decide to be sort of like ambassador of the movie. I have a tiny little role in this role. movie, yes. And I supported it from the beginning and I like the movie. It's, it's, a, it's a family movie. It's a family movie it's, uh, and, and it's about uh, what we've done in Nagano a little bit, but the whole movie is about the children and how we inspire them to be good, uh, to play hockey. Actually, it's not really hockey, it's a hockey on the field. It's a field hockey or sort of like around the houses, but uh, but it's it's about children and it was, this is what I like about it. It was 25 years ago, uh, yes. this anniversary of that great victory. Uh, you Czechs won uh, the first and the single uh, thing time, single time so far, uh, the Golden Olympic uh, medals in Nagano. How huge! Uh, it is for Czechs. Yeah. First, let me say our great team in 70 was three minutes from the gold Olympic medal also. Okay. And they lost Russian 4-3. They were up 3-2, four minutes left and they lost 4-3. So, so this is a so sweet revenge. <laughs> it was sweet revenge, yes. However, uh, it was 1998. It was a little bit different situation. It wasn't the war in Ukraine and I had Russian teammates. So we were closer at that time, let's say. So it, for me, it wasn't like big about the revenge. It was all about Olympics, about the, about the dream. And, and the dream came true. And for me, the dream came true. I would say for everyone on our team and the management, you know, we had a great coach of Ivan Linka and we were a team and nobody believed us before the tournament and we brought to this country a gold medal. And this nation, the Czech, uh, the people in Czech, they appreciate so much, like uh, you cannot imagine, you know. It wasn't about Russian and Czechs, no. We beat USA, we beat Canada in the uh, shootout, and then we beat Russian. And we make this nation so happy and so proud. And uh, you can still feel it anytime there is the an anniversary. Uh, the people talk about it. And even 25 years ago, <laughs> the people, they know exactly what they were doing that day 25 years ago in school and then at home in the restaurant or what they were wearing. The people saw, it's 25 years, but the people still proud and I am proud with my team and so what have we done for the Czech Republic? Yeah, you said about um, Czech public and society and what about you? You were you were a goalie, you were a dominator in those games. Uh, and what I want to quote you, uh, you know there were a couple times I could feel tears in the game against Canada and the game against Russia. We were so focused and we came together at the right time. Uh, how do you recall that 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 games that uh, that play of you? Um, the you talking about Canada, the semifinals? Uh, semifinals. Uh, semifinals. You got shootout like and, and semi then semifinals against Carabis was like I was most memorized game. Okay. You know, it was because we were we had some chances and then we scored the goal and they tie like 60 seconds left and then over time, you know, we were so tired we couldn't even move the legs and then. Then shoot out, you know, and I stopped all five uh, players, uh, Canadians, and we made it to the finals. So, so this is something I still can talk about, not every minute of the game, but about every shootout, you know, one after one. Not because I want to remember it, but because the people still asking me, and when is the anniversary? I can see it on TV, they always show it. And, you know, we were so focused, we were so focused, we were like, each behind, other. we were helping each other so much, you know, we were, we were the team. And I have to repeat again, Ivan Hlinka, he was our leader, you know, he was the coach and we, be we believed in him and, and, you know, and of course, you have to be a little lucky. Always you have to be a little lucky. Do you one of the oldest uh, professionally uh, uh, ice hockey player who played professionally on the ice till 47? I think 46. 46. 46, 46. How it comes? Uh, I retired. Let's say I retired twice. I took one year off, but I came back because I still have feeling for, for hockey. I 
I always had feeling that I can do something for the team. And it was the right decisions. I came back to the NHL. I played in Ottawa and in Detroit, we made it to the semifinals. We won the cup. At the age of 43 or 44, I took one year off. A friend of mine from Pardubice, that's where I am born and where I was raised, came to me and I signed with them. We won the championship at the age of 45 in the Czech Republic. And then I signed for one more year in Russia. I played for a great team of Spartak Moscow. I met great, great players. I don't know, the young people don't remember them, but there was Mr. Starshinov. He was president of the team, who was the many times uh, Olympic champion and, and the world champion. And Mr. Yakushev, Yak 15, I still remember him. So it was a great team, great history. So I play. it was good experience to spend six or seven months, seven or eight months in Russia. And after that, I decided to, de to retire. And you have to love hockey, first of all. If you want to play until age of 45 or 46, you have to love hockey. And you have to be, you have to love to be part of the team, you know, because this is not individual game hockey. You are part of 22, 23, 24 guys. You live in the locker room, you live on the ice and off the ice. And I was like 20, 25 years older than some other guys, but I was part of the team and it, it, it's a great thing to do. So I really enjoy it and, and you have to be lucky. You have to be lucky. Mm -hmm. I was injured a few times, but I always came back. I didn't have too many uh, physical problems. So, but first of all, you have to love the game and you have to be, you have to love to be among in this, part of the team and then you maybe can play for a long time like I did. You mentioned that movie, uh, Death in Ghana, uh, when uh, Dominic Hasek was a young boy, who was your inspiration to get better and to play better? I have three biggest ins inspiration. I have to start with, num I start with number one. My biggest inspiration was tennis player Bjorn Borg. He had long blonde hair and he was so cool. And of course he was winning. Uh, he won like five Wimbledon in the row, and I could see it in Czech on TV. You know, it was it was something wow. However, so Bjorn Borg was for me was number one inspiration, and in hockey it was two inspiration. Vladimir Martinez who was the one of the best. He was from Pardubice where I was born and started to, and play hockey until age of 24, and he was the great forward, one of the best in the in the world, if not the best, is in his prime time. So and the goalie, of course, they had to be the goalie. And the goalie was Yuri Holecek. And he was the starting goalie for the Czech national team. He won the championship in 72, 76 and 77. And he was the one who beat Russia in many games. You know, he played against the great Russian players like Harlamov, Petrov, Maltsev, and he was stopping them. So goalie was Holecek, Vladimir Martinez, he was from the city and Bjernborg he was the biggest one. <laughs> right. You have played against and together in one time with uh, some Latvian players as well, for example, Artur Sirbe, Sandy Sozolinj. Can you, uh, do you remember them? And uh, I know, Sandy Sozolinj, he was the great, uh, great defenseman. I think he played for Colorado, am I right? right? Colorado. And got Stanley Cup with Colorado. Yes, yes, he was a great player. Great player, I remember him. And then he played for the national team. Even he retired from the NHL, right. I saw him play and he was still, Good player, I remember very well. I see him to play for the for the national team at the World World Championship. Yes, uh, and Artur Irbe, I remember him. I think 1989 or 1990, 1990 for sure. And he was he was the goalie for a Russian or Soviet Union national team. He had white white pads. I remember still. Yes, but he was fast. He was he was smaller. But he was so quick and I think 1990 he won the World Championship. He was part of the team, they beat us. And then I played against him in, in the NHL. I remember, I think he played also, maybe I'm wrong in San Jose, but definitely I remember him from, from Carolina when we beat them in, in the Stanley Cup in 2002, I think. Okay, right, and right about San Jose as well, but good yes. memories. Yes. But you don't hide excitement when uh, Peter Pavel uh, became a president of, of Czechia. Why do you think he will be so good for Czechia? 
I hope so, you know, we don't know. I, I cannot say, you never know until he has to prove it, of course. Everybody has to prove it, you know, as, as an athlete, as a politician, there are huge expectations, but you have to prove it. And of course, he has to prove it. But I have good feeling, you know, the way he talks, uh, uh, the way he, he behaves. You know, our former president, or Zeman. Zeman, you know, he was, um, it was, for me, it was a huge disappointment. Meant, you know, he was pro-Russian, pro-Chinese, all all these uh, di um, dictatorships, and and some other things in the Czech in the Czech Republic. What he was doing and how he behaved with uh, with the reporters and certain citizens. It was mm -hmm. it was embarrassing, I have to say. So uh, I believe our new president will be better, but. Of course, like I say in the beginning, I'm excited about him. I vote, I vote for him. Now is the time for him to prove it, and I will support him. Uh, let's see. We are sitting now in Prague. It's in, it's about uh, thousand kilometers from Ukrainian border. Uh, how do you see or how do you feel this presence of war now in Czech Republic in terms of refugees or volunteers? So you, you know what? We, I, I've just listened to the radio and. <laughs> There was an expert who was talking about it. There is about four or five hundred thousand, I think four hundred thousand of Ukrainian. Half a million almost. It's a huge number. And the life in Czech didn't change at all. You know, we really, uh, actually the expert was marking, he said it's from one to five and he marked it two, maybe between one and two. <laughs> so, and I, rate, I, I would rate it very similar, you know, maybe we could do a little bit more, I don't know, but I believe we help Ukrainian people mm -hmm. and the life goes on very smoothly. You know, of course there is COVID, it was COVID, we know about the war, we talk about it every day, it's every day on the, on the news, but I think we did very good job to helping uh, Ukrainian, especially uh, Ukrainian women and children, most of, the refugees are women and children, and now they go to our schools, and and the Ukrainian woman can get job in the Czech Republic. So I think as a Czech country, we did a really good job to help them, and sort of our life is didn't change. So it means I'm pretty happy what we've done. And but I first of all I wish them they can go back to Ukraine and and raise their children and and do whatever they need to do in their country. Right. But right now they are here and I believe it, it works very good for them and for us also, which is important for both sides. Uh, and last question, they say this is a decisive phase of, of the war. And for example, for instance, uh, Chief of Military Intelligence of Ukraine, Kirilla Budanov, uh, said in football terminology, he said, no score is one to one and we are in a minute of 70. I am mean, a little bit worried that we are in the 30 minutes of the game, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. maybe not even in the halftime because this, we have to be, first of all, we need to be prepared for the long war. We don't know. The Russian is a big state. They have lots of people. We need to be prepared for the long war. And Ukraine need our help and we need to supply the help to, for them. And I didn't say it today, but Ukraine is not fighting only for themselves, you know. They're fighting for themselves, but they're also fighting for our country, for your country, you know. If, and it won't happen, but can you imagine if Ukraine loses, which won't happen, we are the next, maybe your country is the next. We need to support Ukraine and they need to get all Russian army back to Russia. This must be our goal. And if we are in the 30 minutes of the game, 60 minutes of the game, 75 minutes of the game, I don't know. Maybe we are not yet in the halftime. Uh, Mr. Hashek, thank you very much for this interview. Thank you also, and like I say, English is not my native language, but I try my best. It was a perfect interview. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you also.